G'day and welcome to the Mind Your Body Show, episode number 46. I am your host, Jacob Andre, and today I am talking to Kurt Vogel. So if you'd like to know more about the menstrual cycle and performance, stay tuned. G'day and welcome to our episode prelude with Kurt Vogel. A big shout out to all of our listeners and our viewers on our many platforms. Of course, across all of the major podcasting platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Big shout out to the people that have left us our five-star ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts and as well to our followers on Instagram and subscribers on YouTube. Please keep engaging with us and sharing all of our content and just leaving us messages and comments. I absolutely adore you guys for that. Now, this episode is brought to you by Revolve Athletic, revolveathletic.com. And I'm going to go through, I'm going to read a little bio here. This is Kurt's website. Revolve Starts off with building stronger athletes by breaking the rules. Revolve Athletic celebrates chaos. We recognize the best athletes fail, the best best athletes don't listen, and the best athletes break the rules. If they didn't break the rules, they'd be just like anybody else, but they're athletes. That's what they do. Revolve Athletic fosters these attitudes, developing both physical and psychological resilience through our individually tailored solutions. I absolutely love that. And this episode is brought to you by Revolve Athletic, revolveathletic.com. Now, Kurt talks about in the episode, actually, his new coaching and mentoring program, which is one of the many, many things that he does. I'm going to read through a quick bio of Kurt. It was, and let's hope this bio actually explains in comprehensive terms what Kurt actually does. Kurt is a physical performance coach for athletes and teams across a variety of sports, in addition to working at USQ in the sport and exercise science department. He has worked purposefully in over 20 different sports from amateur to elite and professional across multiple nations. On top of these roles, Kurt is currently researching the relationship between the menstrual cycle and maximum, maximal strength and speed in soccer athletes. He has been presenting and educating in the realm of strength and conditioning for ASCA and other organizations for nearly a decade and has a strong focus in creating development systems within semi-professional sport. Kurt is an ASCA level three, PCAS elite coach and a master of exercise science, strength and conditioning. And for his work in the semi-professional space, he was awarded 2020 ASCA performance development coach of the year. What an absolute honor. Now, as I was asking Kurt what he does, he just sounded like absolutely everything. And I said, can you put it into one word or just one phrase? Ultimately, he's a sports scientist or strength and conditioning coach, one or the other. You could sort of use both, I think, for Kurt. He's a little bit of everything. But ultimately, I think I'm going to classify him as a strength and conditioning coach. However, he's going to talk today about the menstrual cycle and performance. Now, this seems like it is absolutely cutting edge stuff. There is very little research out there on the menstrual cycle. And as Kurt puts it, what is out there is not really well developed in terms of the study, the the rigors of the study. And so I think what we're going to see here, particularly as women's sport continues to explode, is much more research into this area. Now, if you've got any interest in women's sport, whether you are a female yourself participating in sport, or you are a man involved in women's sport, or you have any interest in women's sport in any way, I think this menstrual cycle and performance research is going to be right up your alley. I was so excited to get into this topic with Kurt, having worked with many women in my own sporting journey and life as a coach. And I have already started implementing some of the stuff that I have uh, learned from Kurt. And I think if you're working in sport, you are going to take away a whole bunch of stuff that you can use yourself. But this is seriously new cutting edge research that we are getting into. And I think we're going to see this really explode over the next couple of years. So this is a very, very exciting time. It's actually a very, very exciting time to be in women's sport, I believe. Anyway, that's enough from me. Without any further ado, let's get into the episode on the menstrual cycle and performance with Kurt Vogel. Kurt, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Jacob. Well, before we get into it, what have you interrupted in your day? I know in our conversations before we hit record that you sound like you're very, very busy today. So what have we interrupted? Uh, just pretty much uh, setting up some biomechanics labs at uh, USQ for their residential schools. So 
Um, but it's uh, it's all good. So everything's managed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good to hear. So one of the first questions I like to ask our guests is, how do you mind your body? How do you look after yourself? Well, um, that's a bit of a, a big question because for me, um, it actually comes from multiple aspects. So um, it's not kind of the typical what people think, try and consistently eat healthy, all that kind of stuff. So I'm, uh, I'm very uh, well balanced in that respect. So I, I end up doing a lot for work. Um, so I don't necessarily get all my training in a lot of the times. So I'll actually balance it out with making sure I do something uh, for myself, something with friends, um, something that actually uh, feeds my soul a bit. So as an example, like I recently bought another set of uh, uh, special edition art pencils because I like to draw here and there. So, um, so I bought those and just started drawing a bit again. Um, but uh, like uh, this weekend, I've got a bunch of sports on. And so I'll actually, uh, it's meant to be at the Gold Coast, uh, although it might be getting shifted. So I'll actually spend the, the day down the Gold Coast with my partner before going to the sporting events that I work with. So, um, so yeah, so it's a bit of a, a balance overall, but it's a, uh, it can be a very big question because for me, I do so many different things. So I'm going to go to our normal, typical third question. But before I do, I just want to touch on what you just mentioned there. So the sporting groups that you work with, who are they and what are they? Um, at the moment, I'm working with uh, Queensland Lions uh, Football Club. So uh, they're a soccer club which uh, has a very good and strong history. Uh, um, I started with the women's team at the start of the year and then halfway through took over the men's team and the sports science as well. And as of next year, I'll be taking over the whole program uh, from NPL, NPLW down through to under eights. Um, so that's going to be my um, priority in that respect. Uh, I also work with the boxing shop. Uh, so I work with their boxers from their elite amateurs uh, through to their professionals. Uh, and outside of that, I do some consulting mentoring, then also work with individual athletes across multiple sports. So the individual athletes I work with uh, are in athletics, uh, weightlifting, uh, rowing, um, soccer again, rugby league. Uh, and so I work across uh, <laughs> quite a few sports at the moment. Sounds very, very busy. And you're obviously doing very well for yourself. So back to that question, how did you end up where you are right now in life? Tell me about the Kurt story. So. Uh, it's a big story, um, so I'll try and keep it as, as short as I can, but um, a lot, it's quite interesting because a lot of people, uh, when they get into coaching, they, they found their way in coaching, and um, for me, I actually wanted to be an architect since I was 10, and then when it came to choosing things in year 12 to study, I was like, you know, I'm sick of math, so I'll actually do some PE teaching, so I actually started first two years in PE teaching, and uh, my uh, lecturer, Tony Attridge, was actually... Um, he's really good. He's uh, a high level SNC coach, and uh, I did my cert three and four PT certificates through him um, and his business, the College of Health and Fitness. And uh, he kind of got me in the coaching aspect a little bit, and I, I changed to exercise science. And uh, it was very fortunate the first year in exercise science that I was living at Griffith University on the colleges. and. Uh, I noticed that like magpies uh, were training there. And so I went to the coach and just asked, hey, uh, I've just started exercise science. Um, can I just get some experience and, uh, and see uh, what it's like? I, I can help out as much as possible. Uh, and I, I work at the gym up there as well. So, because I just started working at Griffith Uni Gym. And they said, yeah, no problem, uh, come on board. And I ended up uh, being assistant strength and conditioning coach for the year and uh, it was the first year with the Canberra Raiders and they won a premiership and I was like that's a good way to start um, <laughs> and so it's, it's gone up and down from there really it's uh I, I worked at Griffith Uni uh, whilst I was studying uh, then after I finished my undergrad I actually ended up uh, working for Griffith University as a social sport coordinator uh, facilities coordinator um, and then taking over their gym facilities at Nathan campus uh, and then whilst I was doing that I was still undertaking like any kind of coaching with different teams different athletes and uh, and then I opened my own studio on the north side of Brisbane and uh, two and a half years into that uh, we'll start we'll pretty much just get into the break-even point and then we flooded uh, and then it took probably about three months to get insurance back and we really didn't have the, the savings kind of to 
bump us up for, for that long. And I ended up getting a gig at USQ uh, in the sport and exercise department at the start of their degree as a tech officer. And um, so I closed the business and, and started USQ. Again, still coaching um, across this whole time. So I've gone from part-time coaching to full-time coaching back to part-time. And uh, I guess the USQ opportunity was really uh, valuable for me. Uh, it's a technical officer role. Uh, so pretty much uh, setting up our classes, supporting academics, supporting research, supporting students. Um, but across the time at USQ that I also have been fortunate enough to work with different teams like testing for the Brisbane Bullets and Western Pride, uh, but I also teach in their programs now too. So I teach into the functional anatomy course and I have for the last three years and the strength and conditioning course. Uh, and I guess because of the opportunities USQ has given me, it also allowed me to kind of step into some other aspects outside of uh, areas I didn't think I'd be into. So uh, because of my uh, sports science uh, accreditation with ESSA, uh, I ended up getting caught upon uh, with ESSA a few times in 2015-16 and ended up being uh, the uh, sports scientist of the year, but also the lead uh, or keynote sports scientist for, uh, what was it? I think it was fitness week or health week or something like this, or maybe science week or something. And so um, presenting in Queen Street, uh, pretty much testing different athletes on their fitness. And uh, I ran into some ballet dancers and uh, from Queensland Ballet. And I ended up getting involved with ballet quite a bit in sports science. And, uh, and that was that was really valuable in regards to looking at uh, accelerometers and the sports science data quite a lot more. Uh, I actually developed my own little inertial measurement unit and programmed that and, and tested that with Queensland Ballet dancers and uh, took myself and the, one of the physios from Queensland Ballet over to Texas uh, for a conference uh, uh, to present on that data, uh, which is uh, quite cool. But uh, that, that kind of opened a lot of doors uh, in different aspects, particularly research. And so uh, through, I guess, that aspect of kind of wanting to get into research more so I can actually take on more of an academia role. And uh, so at the moment, I end up getting into mental cycle research uh, and I've got really good supervisors, uh, Chris McClellan, Stephen Bird, and Brianna Larson. And so, um, anyone, I guess, that's been in SNC World for a while should know Stephen Bird and um, potentially Chris McClellan and, uh, and Brianna Larson, uh, if you know mental psycho research. But uh, it hasn't really spoken much about my coaching. It's, that's just a journey and on the side of I've kind of coached all this time. So over that time, I've kind of tried to dedicate my, I guess, time to working in areas that um, needed more development. And, and that, I guess, comes from my background where I'm a Kai. Um, getting scouted and picked up from different uh, NRL clubs uh, and from a manager that they just tell you to hit these goals and, and you're like, but how? Like, how do I get to that goal? And, uh, and there was no real help um, at that time. And so I guess I've always focused in coaching is helping develop areas that need development. Um, so um, it's ended up uh, having me uh, work with uh, talent ID um, with AIS, QIS, it's, it's had me um, end up taking uh, roles in development, but also uh, rejecting roles with higher level positions. Uh, so um, it's been a big journey. I've now worked across, I think, 27 different sports. Uh, and as an example, in regards to how long this journey has been uh, in rugby league at Southside Magpies, uh, I do really value staying at a club. Uh, and I I've worked with Southside Magpies from Intra Super Cup, the Reserves, Colts, under 16s, under 18s, and actually the women's side as well. So I've worked at all different levels in that club too. So, so I don't just go, I need to work at the highest level. I look at where we need development and how to move forward. Um, and so at the moment, my focus tends to be uh, developing systems in sem semi-professional sport. So rather than just taking a role, I'll start to create a system for interns to come through and then essentially try and make myself redundant in those positions uh, or shift people to other areas uh, or, or help them grow from there. So uh, I guess that's kind of where I sit at the moment. 
Um, it's uh, yeah, I could get into far more detail, and it's probably very scattered, and people going, how, "So how did he actually get there?" Uh, <laughs> that's kind of I'm a little chaotic in in that sense. And if you if you talk to my mum and dad, if you talk to my uh, partner, if you talk to any of my friends, and they go, "So what does Kurt do?" They're like, "Um, he does a few things." Um, <laughs> So no one really, really knows. I would just say sports scientist or strength conditioning coach, but I do quite a few different things here and there. So it's yeah. so funny you say that because at the end of it, I was going, I reckon my brain went off in about a hundred different direction of like which question I was going to ask first. <laughs> and then I thought, okay, just come back to if there was one job title you would give yourself, what is that? What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> I, I just end up at the end of the day, um, I pretty much just say, um, physical performance coach uh, or uh, sports scientist, because I mean, I, I do both, but within physical performance, uh, you uh, account for sports science really. So I think it probably works the best uh, in, that, in that realm really. Okay, I'm gonna pick one spot to start and then we'll go from there. And so seeing as we're here to talk about the menstrual cycle and performance, let's start with that. Yeah. How did you get into this you talked about being interested in areas that need development and that sort of come back naturally to you as a coach i presume that's kind of why but how did you end up getting into menstrual cycle research so uh i guess although i'd worked in rugby league for a while uh i ended up working with a lot of male teams and athletes and then started getting more uh female clients and i started working with uh female teams more so uh, that started with QT Hockey Club. I worked with both men's and women's teams. Uh, so that was kind of my first exposure to team sports in women, uh, women's sports. And then, uh, and then uh, from there, I took over uh, rugby league. So BHP Women's Rugby League competition at South Lake Magpies and, um, and been involved in uh, women's sport for about seven years now. Uh, and then... I guess I had some consultation with different sports as well. So I worked with Ipswich Netball on, on their testing side of things while uh, Freya Greensill was the SNC coach and lead for that. And so working across a lot of these uh, uh, women's teams and also my uh, kind of want to study something interesting and intriguing uh, kind of led me to this path a little bit. So if you talk to any of the academics at the university, the amount of times I've asked them about a subject or topic like, I'm very fortunate enough to have these academics around me because they'll tell me, no, it's not worth it. There's no research behind it, all that kind of stuff. And then uh, last year, uh, we, uh, USQ hired Stephen Bird and Brandon Larson. And then uh, it just happened to be that I was in women's sport already. And then looking at, I guess, undertaking some further research in women's sports and they kind of directed me to look at uh, the menstrual cycle a little bit more. And I already do it. I already undertake education with athletes on that. So uh, I taught in the QT dance program. And as part of that, uh, there are only two males in the whole cohort. Uh, so I actually ran a full week on uh, women's health. And so and I actually said to the guys, you're welcome to stay to learn more about this uh, as well. So it's, it's really beneficial, but obviously when your major cohort is women, I think it's important. And so I've undertaken a lot of education with these athletes. So I, I thought, well, why not actually study that area a little bit more? And, and I think Brianna has been uh, uh, amazing in regards to critiquing all the, the evidence and even my opinions. I, I have it from previously teaching uh, athletes about this as well. Like I have uh, some experience in, in teaching athletes about the menstrual cycle and it's amazing how much uh, uh, athletes don't know about it, but uh, Brianna uh, was also supervised by um, Claire Minahan, so and she's pretty much kind of known as one of the major ladies in mental cycle research. And uh, I was fortunate enough to have her sit on my confirmation of candidature as well. So having these people that are very heavy in the mental cycle research critique my own work has made me more critical of of this as well. And so that's made me even more inquisitive about getting into this kind of topic. So, and then for me, it's, it's not necessarily about injuries, it's more about performance. Uh, there is a lot of research on injuries, uh, research on the hormonal effect of different things. Um, but 
I'm looking into performance specifically and then going from there. Um, and so it's kind of how I got in, involved in it. There was a couple of academics at the uni kind of uh, opened my eyes a little bit more to something I was already involved in. So I've worked with women for quite a few years and there's a big difference between coaching women and coaching men, in my opinion. And um, most recently, I've come to be looking after the Darwin-based Adelaide Crows AFLW players. And so I've got a real vested interest in their level of performance and particularly around this menstrual cycle stuff. Yeah. Um, I've also, through that, just naturally started to take on more work with more women. So I've had other local football clubs come on and ask me to do stuff. Nightclub Football Club, for example, previously Wanderers Football Club, and there's other sports in there as well. So what can you tell me about this research that I can take in and practically use? Yeah. Um, well, in regards to the data, we haven't been able to start data collection just yet because it was originally going to be with rugby league. Uh, and we ended up in an unfortunate circumstance where our rugby league team I was working with made the grand final last year and we folded this year. It was very unfortunate. Um, I actually started uh, take, undertaking familiarization with the athletes and then we ended up folding. Um, so it's more so been around uh, research I've gathered and some pilot testing already. Um, so in regards to what you could use or what anyone else can use, it's, it's a little bit uh, out there at the moment, but currently it's more about looking at, like at the moment, I've been looking heavily into the methodology of all these research papers, because when you, when you start to look at the research methodology rather than the research outcome, that's where you realize how poor a lot of these studies are. And it, you, I guess the biggest thing about research is you need studies to start to begin with, like, so they're never going to be the greatest methodologies, but when there's no consistency around these studies, you go, what can I actually rely on? And so currently we're, we're relying mainly on, I guess, what effect the hormones have on the body. And so um, in the different phases, you've got different effects on the body because of estrogen and progesterone. And, and so that's where the main outcomes are at the moment uh, in regards to assuming uh, any kind of performance benefit um, but uh, in regards to my own research, uh, the data is yet to be fully collected because we're going to test uh, pretty much three times per week over um, a, a five-week period. Uh, if we've got no tracking on those uh, women, then it'll be over a longer period. Uh, but uh, we want a minimum if we've had those athletes track for at least two months in their menstrual cycle, so we know they're consistent. And, um, and that's probably the most data anybody's gathered on any kind of menstrual cycle project in regards to performance. So, uh, and so those types of, I guess, methodologies are important because all we've got are research studies that assume benefits at different aspects of those uh, higher, I guess, estrogen uh, level times compared to those high progesterone level times and where both of them are low. So, so we've got a lot of assumptions rather than actually assessing over the entire menstrual cycle and seeing what actually happens and seeing if we can actually track a curve of performance the same as we can uh, the hormones. So there's a lot of assumptions at the moment, really. So how do you think this research would ultimately be used? So what I'm assessing uh, to begin with is uh, maximal strength and maximal speed. And so we're using low fatigue tests. And what I mean by low fatigue is uh, we're using an isometric uh, quarter squat rather than a, a pull because uh, familiarization with trying to get a pull and wraps and it can, can take a while, but everyone knows how to squat, get on a bar and push hard. So, um, so we're going to use an isometric quarter squat. Uh, we're also going to be using a 30 meter uh, sprint test. So running sprint test. And so both because they're not extensive and we're not using a uh, high amount of reps, uh, you'll be able to get that data. And then you can actually see over dis different aspects of uh, the menstrual cycle, how it may affect um, not just, I guess, females in, uh, as a general group in that specific sport, but uh, how each individual may vary as well. Because you may find that every single person varies completely differently. So there's no actual uh, consistency, but we are also making sure we verify uh, the menstrual cycle hormones through blood verification too. So that way we've got an idea of 
what their progesterone and estrogen levels are like. Um, we're also uh, assessing testosterone as well to see if there is any effect there too. So ultimately, you can then potentially say, okay, uh, during this time of uh, your menstrual cycle, uh, you're most likely going to be stronger. So we can actually get our heavy lifts in here, whereas these periods are going to be uh, weaker. So we can actually lower our loads here. And, and at the moment, there is some evidence uh, around to show that if you want to take training programs with a high volume in the follicular phase and low volume in the uh, luteal phase, you actually get a greater improvement in uh, your strength gains uh, than if you just had a consistent program across the whole menstrual cycle. Uh, but can you can you just explain those on, phases real quickly? Um, I'll jump in just in, in just a second on that, but just to I guess as an example with that data that people are getting. Uh, it's really interesting when you start to critique some of this because when you start to critique a little bit further and say this is just what's happened in women uh, when you start to look at comparisons there's no actual comparisons whether you did the same type of volume loading in males if you get the same improvement in results so uh, although it's going to be outside of the research and it's going to be integrated within the club that I'm working with uh, I'll be assessing males as well so I can actually compare data sets. Uh, so that's kind of another uh, stepping stone, which I'm looking to do uh, to say this happens in females. Let's see what happens if we use comparative data and see if there are actual differences. So that's kind of what I'm looking at. And because it's, it's great to assess uh, a sex and go and this works for this. Um, but I mean, it could work exactly the same uh, for males and we just, haven't assessed the same types of studies. So it's, it's quite um, interesting to say the least, because we've assessed a ton of different things on males and very little in females only, but we need to also compare the groups. So um, now in regards to what you're saying, uh, the different phases. So you've got the follicular phase and the luteal phase. So when you look at the menstrual cycle, day one or day zero starts uh, when the period starts, and that's the start of the follicular phase. So uh, what you get is an increase in estrogen uh, during that period. And it's, it's nearly like an a easy parabola um, to the roughly a 14 day uh, block. Uh, now, the average menstrual cycle is about 28 days, but it can extend shorter or longer. Um, so we're gonna use the middle, middle aspect of 14 days. Uh, and so that's the end of the follicular phase where ovulation is that little period there. So, which is pretty much a day to two days. Uh, and then it kicks over to the luteal phase where uh, estrogen actually decreases and progesterone increases. So what you've got is a, a different balance of the uh, hormones where the follicular phase is low progesterone, high estrogen, and the luteal phase is high progesterone, low estrogen. Uh, so uh, they're the main things that uh, tend to look at in regards to performance. And then uh, when you start to look at other hormones that are known, like follicular, um, Stimulating hormones, so FSH and uh, um, uh, and a little hormones. Then we've got that's just accounting for ovulation. So they're not really something that we look at in performance per se. It's more so to verify the menstrual cycle. So you so mentioned testosterone. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, this is so interesting. You mentioned testosterone. How does that um, get influenced between the estrogen and in that whole cycle? Well, there's not too many studies on it. So pretty much there is a, a small variability, but testosterone can actually change with uh, strength training and uh, intense aerobic training as well. So, uh, so that's kind of what we ultimately look to see is when we aren't assessing testosterone daily or anything, we're just assessing it with the menstrual cycle verification to see um, if there's any associations with that at all. But uh, there's not really too much data on testosterone uh, in, in females. So um, there's a little bit. I think there's some studies when you look at testosterone and cortisol ratio, but again, they've assessed it on their own and not assessed it with other hormones, progesterone, and estrogen, or luteinizing hormone or follicular stimulating hormone. So, uh, so there's, there's missing data across the research, and that's probably the biggest issue here. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit real quickly. Where do you see this going? This sounds like it's very, very 
much in its infancy and is about to explode as women's sport, I think, continues to really explode at, as I feel like it's doing at the moment. Yeah, so wh where do you see all of this going? Um, I think uh, there's going to be a ton of research coming out in the next few years around it. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of women's health experts who have done a ton of uh, work with uh, periods and, and health uh, and mental cycle and, and health, really. Uh, but we're trying to start to look more in regards to the performance aspect. Uh, there is a lot of information starting to come out, come out about nutrition and menstrual cycles as well. So it's then, then another avenue to, to dive into. So um, I think uh, so. Claire Minahan has done a lot of work with, and Carly Quinn has done a lot of work with uh, like rugby league and Jill LaRue's programs and, uh, and uh, the Roar. And so they've done a ton of different work and just gathering perception data as well. So we know it definitely has an effect on some level, but... Some of, some of those things are actually counterintuitive to what we think. So when you look at where it's going, I think it's going to explode in the next five to 10 years. And, uh, but I think the biggest thing is we need to learn to be critical about this data and actually have a look at the, how the study is undertaken too, because you're getting some studies that show there's no effect, but they haven't even confirmed a menstrual cycle. They're just basing it off of uh, their, their participants saying, I've had my period. So there's no tracking at all. Um, and then there's some that have the same thing, but say there are improvements in uh, performance. So you've got to look at um, the methodology and just be critical of the research, really. So how does this influence your research so far and more so anecdotally what you've gathered, your programming and prescription of training with the athletes that you work with? So just from what I originally started to look into, um, I actually started to use RPE-based methods a lot more uh, in strength training rather than prescribing values, purely because you're likely to get uh, someone to work off their respective RPE on that day. Um, and if there's education around that, they're not going to push too hard. So and what I mean by that is some athletes can get really competitive. So if they've lifted a certain way one week and the next week, they're not feeling great and they're, they're going to get really bummed about not lifting the same weight. But it's the same as any kind of stress response, right? Where if you're stressed, if you've had less sleep, lift less. So working off a more of an RPE basis and, and what I've found so far just in my own work is it works quite well. Uh, sometimes it might seem like a little bit of underloading, uh, but in regards to prevent, uh, prevention for injury and performance, it's worked out quite well. Uh, so with, I guess, with this research, what I'm looking at doing is also seeing how you can actually implement in a semi-professional environment rather than just a professional because full-time programs are great. You've got access to uh, the athletes at all times. So, which is awesome. You, you can manipulate each training session um, to a certain extent. But when you look at a semi-professional environment from the data I've gathered, uh, I recently gathered a bunch of data I got out of 18 uh, athletes 14 had consistent menstrual cycles. And when you looked at it over a 60 day period, uh, there I think was one day where one of them didn't have a uh, uh, period at some point. And so you're like, well, if you've only got 14 athletes and over a 60 day period, there's only one day gap where someone doesn't have a period, how do you think that's going to influence training uh, individually, but as a group? Like, how can you just go, okay, we're going to adjust for the whole group because these three people uh, aren't in the right training phase because you can't really do that with a team. You can do it in, in, uh, in strength work. You can do it in conditioning work. But in regards to coaching, the coaches want to know most of all is how they can manipulate training. But when you have to work with different sets and different pieces and high intensity, I mean, there's a certain uh, level of manipulation, but... You've also got to learn to work through those tougher periods, right? Like, this is another question I think we need to ask is, sure, we can get a great benefit out of potentially manipulating training in different cycles, but is there a point at which we need to build resilience in the time where you, the athletes can't handle greater volumes because at some point they're going to have to play a game and a high-intensity game at that time in the cycle as well. So how do you then proceed forward with this data? And that's kind of what where the questions we want to ask and the questions we want to kind of get answers to is 
is where to where to go from here and and so far in my my own practices it's more so implement, implemented or oh, sorry influenced how i've um, modified training that still allows everyone to do everything but at their own level of intensity and volume really yeah i'm so glad you asked that because it was the next question i was going to ask and that was you know on game day particularly if it's a grand final say for example not everyone's going to be feeling cherry ripe um, and they're not going to be at the perfect point in their menstrual cycle so how does that influence it all and come back to training for that yeah so, yeah that, that's a big question something we don't really know just yet um so claire and carly have uh, been doing some research with the ruse and what they found surprisingly um was that uh although despite a lot of perceptions around feeling terrible uh, around um pre-period and the start of the period, that athletes generally perform better in those times. Um, and they're, they're unsure why, but currently it's uh, like when you talk to the athletes, they're saying, well, I know I'm feeling like crap. So I actually have to kind of G myself up a bit more because I've got to try and perform better. And so they actually end up in a better state because they're g themselves up because they feel bad. So every athlete is different in that. Some will actually play terribly. Um, some will play outstanding. And, and uh, if you talk to each athlete, they're all different in regards to how they deal with it. And I presume, are you talking about there with a team sport like soccer or Aussie rules football, um, yeah. where it's an extended period of time, as opposed to, you know, just a short, sharp, you know, 100 meter sprint type event? Yeah, exactly. So if you're in uh, an individual sport, it can be easily manipulated and far, far easier manipulated than a team sport. So I think this is where uh, most research occurs in team sports to begin with because you get numbers and impact in research. But when you look at the menstrual cycle data, it's very rare to find any data over 14 people in a study um, that is consistent. So um, we just lack a bit of data at the moment, but it starts with team sports and then it dwindles down individuals because let's say athletics, for example, if you look into athletics and you go, well, um, we need numbers for athletics. How many individuals are you going to find, say female um, sprinters in one area that can actually undertake the study? There's probably not too many at the same level. So you, then you get, you're missing data again, right? Yeah. So what would be a good number in your participants? So, and that, that's hard. So usually you want to take a power study to begin with, like a, a power analysis, sorry. So to assess what you'd actually uh, be able to get a good impact with. So it will change depending on your study, depending on the, the uh, data that you gather. Uh, but at the moment, realistically, it's going, what you can get is uh, at least... Uh, 12 to 15 because they're the major cohorts that we're working with at the moment so if you can get that and then you can gather data off multiple cohorts then you can start to join that data together but you need to be able to gather those different cohorts at the same time of the year um, so it might be a, a matter of going okay we need to get three clubs on board to gather the data in a pre-season so um, which may mean multiple researchers or it may mean they all come to the same location for testing so it can be a bit difficult in that respect because that requires them funding. So it, uh, it's, it's a bit of a funny one where there's a lot of answers we don't know. And it's uh, particularly in regards to what impact are required. It's, it's great to have high numbers, but the realistic expectation of being able to get high numbers isn't too high. <laughs> so you, you've started to touch on a bit here with training and that. And I want to know a bit more about conditioning because you've spoken previously uh, about yeah. conditioning and it not being exactly um, what it should be. Can you talk yeah. more about that? Okay, yeah. So, um, so stepping to the side of the menstrual cycle at the moment, we're talking about conditioning on the field. I think when we look at conditioning, first of all, a lot of coaches that come out of exercise science degrees or even uh, use different certifications, they get caught up in indoor conditioning a lot. And so I think they, they miss a crucial component of outdoor conditioning, particularly when we look at team sports. Uh, a lot of the times, if you look at individual sport, the coach will actually write conditioning sessions, which is great because they undertake their coaching for that specifically. Um, but when you look at team sports, the 
you're trying to get a lot of knowledge of how to run things indoors but outdoors there's a limitation uh so and then when we get outdoors we get stuck in oh mas is the best thing we can possibly do because that's how we increase the vo2 max but like there are multiple components to conditioning why are we focus so heavily on mas and and so i think conditioning isn't what it's really uh or what it really isn't or can be because i think we lack uh, a lot of uh, not necessarily experimentation but outdoor experience um, in that sense so if you look at even trying to maintain load right in a in a high level sport you go okay we need to maintain load we need to maintain load you need to cycle load not necessarily maintain it because if you talk to any athlete about three quarters of a season they start to get burnt out so do you need to maintain load or do you need to cycle load like that's it's another question altogether um i think what we seem to lack is uh is the conditioning around that rather than just saying okay you're going to have to do this now um as a conditioning base you need to be able to manipulate and and be able to run multiple intensities within the same block of training uh, rather than just have a, a straight run set have a change of direction set like a good example would be using the illinois uh, agility test use that as actual conditioning exercise rather than agility test so using these types of aspects in a conditioning world rather than just going okay we're going to do 15 on 15 off for eight sets two minutes rest and go again like there are different ways to integrate conditioning into different training uh, blocks i think we uh, lack that extensive experience compared to when you look at strength training if we go to strength training everyone goes oh we've got all opinions here 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 and here we can manipulate this 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 and you go to conditioning and everyone's like you got mas uh tempo <laughs> speed probably that it <laughs> so yeah that's, that's kind of what i mean in regards to that respect and so how does the conditioning link in with the menstrual cycle and performance stuff what effect does it have so again it's it's hard because we, we can get we can say oh it has this effect but again there's inconsistent data around it so all we can start to look at is, is load so uh when we look at uh i guess the most prominent uh results we've got from any kind of research would come into injuries uh and that would be uh at the moment uh with i say at the moment because research can come out and change is uh showing around ovulation that uh, you can get an actual uh change in uh ligament uh, tension so pretty much you get a slight change in that uh that tension ligament so you get slightly looser joints now that sounds really exaggerated because you don't necessarily get looser joints per se um but it means that there is less stiffness in those ligaments so when you cut or change direction your joints may not be uh, supported as well by those ligaments uh but when you look at the experience an athlete has uh and if you compare that to a less experienced athlete it's pretty much comes down to strength a lot of the time as well so uh you can have ligaments that have less laxity but if you don't have the joint to uh joint strength to surround it by the other musculature then that's where you're going to start to have a few injuries right so when you look at conditioning and if you're looking at get small side gains conditioning that could be a a uh, modification that you have to take into account uh so but if someone has the experience and they're strong enough then you could probably chuck them in but this again it's a lot of no answers and people probably going why are there still no answers but there isn't there isn't any answers that are definitive right now to say this is that and this is that but there is evidence to show that when you account for experience and strength that there are no differences between males and females in regards to injury rate either so uh and when you account for i think it's i don't quote me on this one this is coming from memory so uh, i think it's when you account for strength and muscle mass as well women and men may i think are very similar as well so it is there's a lot of interesting new research coming out that are actually undertaken that actually got really good methodologies behind them uh and are producing some really good data so when you look at conditioning you might not have to change too much but again it might come down to women can to ha- can handle more volume in the follicular phase so you can go we're going to do higher volume work here and then we're going to do lower volume work uh in the luteal phase because you can't recover as well so you might actually modify conditioning around that but 
At the moment, again, I still go for RPE based. So, and that works for the same as injuries. So rather than just menstrual cyclers, if you're feeling a bit tight, you're jumping into lower conditioning block today. And if, uh, if you're feeling not great, you're in the lower conditioning block. Like for me, it's all of a, it's an all, all a variation of stress. So it's a stress response uh, in, in essence. Uh, now, uh, when you look, talk to purists, technically it's, a, it's not a stress response, but there's a stress response because you've got a fluctuating hormonal response and there are premenstrual symptoms that occur. So there is a stress response. So, yeah. <laughs> I get what you're saying with the RPE, but is there a possibility that you could end up in a training group? Because we're typically talking about team-based sports here. Uh, like soccer, which is the main sport that you work with, where you have got a group in the first half of the phase, the menstrual cycle, and another group in the second half, and you kind of categorize them as best you can through that. And you say, okay, you you girls are going to do this session today, and you girls are going to do this session today. Is that is it kind of almost like there's two groups going out to do a session, or is it everyone and then we're just manipulating the RPE? So it's pretty much everyone are manipulating RPE because at the same time, you've got, uh, you've got conditioning blocks that the coaches run. So uh, are you going to chuck the girls into two different groups and then have them do the same block with the, with the coach? Like, so it's not really uh, conducive to kind of have those kind of blocks either. And because everyone's in slightly different phases, it's, you might actually have at one point three people in one phase and then uh, 15 in another. So it's pretty much separating into groups of fitness and then going from there or groups of speed and going from there, depending on the type of block. So uh, that's kind of how I, I work at the moment. Now, the next thing I want to ask about is because you're in Brisbane, which is subtropical and I'm in Darwin, which is tropical. So have you done anything around heat training? And even if it's just anecdotal, what have you noticed in its relation to the menstrual cycle training and performance? Hmm. Um, I haven't really done too much in regards to heat in the menstrual cycle. or um, And I guess when you look at Queensland weather, uh, to be honest, it's nearly kind of sunny all year round. Uh, but uh, so it's more, I've only just noticed uh, in regards to performance in general. So not, not any, any relationship to the menstrual cycle. So, um, and, and, but the only thing I would have uh, will have, would have have noticed is the menstrual cycle symptoms will pick up if uh, it is a hotter day because the the athlete is just feeling more uncomfortable. So, um, but that's it. Uh, that's all the only thing I've noticed. So I haven't really noticed anything in regards to heat and performance. It's just any athlete feels some sometimes uncomfortable when it gets too hot, <laughs> and so I pretty much promote the exact same things regardless. Yeah. So you've talked about working with a lot of different sports and a lot of different groups. Tell me about Revolve Athletic. Um, so it's a bit of an interesting uh, one. So um, my company previously was Guru Sports Performance and um, the name Guru came about strangely because I think it was in a one or two, two week period, there were uh, I think three different coaches that ended up um, calling me guru and they had no association with each other so um, it was just because I like to explain the reasons behind it, why I do things so they all use it to call me a teacher and so one of my clients um, ended up being one of my business partners as well at the time and uh, and they said let's just use that as a name and and that's where it started but kind of looking at a name and changing things around is where I kind of came up with Revolve a little bit more. And so uh, my logo for Revolve is actually part of a regen of Guru Sports Performance from like 2014. Um, and so although I've been kind of uh, self-employed for a while in that respect, um, I ended up coming up with the Revolve Athletic uh, or Revolve after Guru Sports Performance back in 2015. And then it kind of just evolved to Revolve Athletic. Um, and mainly to have that attachment to athleticism, really. So, uh, and also to make it a little bit simpler for people to understand uh, where it sits in, in, uh, in our world uh, of strength conditioning. So, I mean, so at the moment, it just sits in the back end of that's, that's the name I operate under. Um, but 
it will be expanding at some point uh, in the future. So I'll be having uh, specific coach mentoring programs run through Revolve Athletic. Uh, I'll have a different, a bunch of different uh, academies run through Revolve Athletic as well. So it's all going to start to come under that name a little bit more where I'll actually have more coaches coming on board. So um, <clears throat> uh, another coach that I work with currently, um, I'm having him uh, kind of subcontract under Revolve Athletic soon as well. So uh, and he's a really great coach, uh, Miko Olivia. So uh, he's been really good and really instrumental in uh, also uh, the Lions success in the in the 23s too. So he's been really great there. So what uh, products and or services do you specifically offer to people and how can they get involved? Uh, so this is one where when you talk to people in business and they go, you should have set for us. Um, pretty much uh, mine is ad hoc consultation. So uh, I don't have uh, a lot of time to take on individuals all the time. So a lot of it's online programming. So generally it's online pro programming with consultation in person if you're in Southeast Queensland or uh, external consultation uh, if you're in other states. Uh, I undertake coach development and coach mentoring. So uh, pretty much those two. Otherwise, outside of that, um, it's ad hoc consultation. And consultation fits in a lot of things, like as an example, uh, working with Lions, uh, Revolve Athletic also uh, over that. And that means I'll let people come on board to support that. So I might lead it, but as an example, I'm going away in two weeks for a holiday. And that was meant to be post-season holiday, but lockdown delayed the season. So I'm away for two weeks during the semifinals. I get back the day before the grand final. So I've actually got a bunch of people working with me um, that will be supporting that kind of system. Uh, and that's kind of fits, how, how it fits under Revolve Athletic a bit too. So if you want to simplify it, it's individual uh, online consultation. Uh, uh, I do uh, undertake rehab in regards to that as well. So it's not just performance, it's rehab too. Uh, coach uh, mentoring and consultation uh, and development. Uh, and then from there, it's ad hoc in regards to if you want sports science and consultation, if you want uh, advice, if you want specific programs, like that's depending on what you want. So how can people contact you to get involved with this? Um, so you can contact me on Kurt at revolveathletic.com. Uh, it's exactly spelt how it sounds. Um, or you can head to revolveathletic.com and on the main page, you've got... Uh, uh, contact form so and that's where most people contact me or people weirdly enough con contact me on instagram a lot so kurtvogel.coach or revolve athletic on instagram so either one uh i get a lot of business uh, from rehab on instagram and i'm getting a lot of on online consultations from my website awesome and of course we'll link all that up in the show notes um, as we start to wrap up can you just quickly Clarify for me what specifically you do at the university. <laughs> so at the university, my full-time role is a senior technical officer in sport and exercise science. So that's supporting the academics, the our research of the students with equipment and their needs around that. Um, also managing the labs across the space. So I actually put together the, the uh, sport and exercise lab, the uh, strength lab, the um, physiology clinic. Uh, so I kind of put those spaces together and manage that. Uh, but I also um, demonstrate and lecture depending on the uh, semester uh, within some of the programs too. So uh, this year I uh, contributed to functional anatomy, strength training, conditioning and exercise program delivery. So that is what I do at the university. And outside of that, I'm a student researcher. So what, what would you say just as a joke, <laughs> I'm going to ask this question. What would you say is your main job? So my main job at university is technical, senior technical officer. So that is my main job. So I work uh, 38 hours or 37, whatever it's meant to be, hours uh, doing that job. So that is my main yeah. job. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a great job. I love it. Yeah, that's yeah, that's cool. You are so busy. I don't know how you find time <laughs> to do anything. <laughs> I think What's it's, next? Uh, sorry? Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have the support from the academics and my manager um, as well at USQ because they actually promote continuing uh, my work outside of the university. So I think I've, I'm fortunate to have that support from the university as well. And, and, and that's what uh, they're really good at. They're supporting the 
uh, the people to still uh, stay current in their industry. Yeah, that's cool. So what's next for Kurt Vogel? Uh, so what's next? So pretty much continue my research. Uh, so take that a little bit further. Uh, and also um, getting into a little bit more structured and systemized mentoring programs. So uh, hopefully end of October, I'll be launching my uh, mentoring program, which is a structured uh, mentoring program. I'm also um, launching four online academies, which will integrate sports psych, uh, sports nutrition, sports physio, uh, and also sports coaching uh, within those academies too. Geez, that sounds awesome. Can you tell me a little bit more about the coaching and mentoring program? So pretty much uh, it'll be, I'm just deciding if I'm going to extend that to 12 weeks or keep it at 10 weeks. I'm oh, sorry, not weeks, sorry, uh, blocks, because I think 10 weeks is too short. Uh, so deciding if it's going to be 10 or 12 uh, blocks where you're going to have a different topic on each block uh, and it's going to be integrating practical uh, mentoring as well as a little bit of theoretical as well. So I find we get a lot of theory um, in coaching, but we don't do a lot of reflection and assessment in our own coaching. So that's what I'm looking to undertake uh, with different coaches. And so I, I run that ad hoc at the moment, but I'm looking to systemize that soon. So uh, as an example, it might be uh, one block is going to be uh, specifically on rather than strength conditioning methods, it's actually going to be coaching and how to improve uh, your coaching within a team environment. So uh, you might have a challenge on a certain week to uh, conduct uh, a session where you're running demonstration only cues. And so you're gonna to have to talk to your team and go, all right guys, we know what we're doing, but I'm only allowed to cue using demonstrations only, so I'm not allowed to talk for the next half an hour. So, um, and what you'll do, you'll get a bit of laughter out of the team, but you'll also get an improvement on your coaching because you have to understand how uh, you're going to coach without being able to talk. So we're just tra challenging our own coaching in that mentoring process. Yeah, that's awesome. So is this a solely in-person type program or is it online as well? So this is online as well. So if you are in person with me undertaking uh, coaching already, uh, there'll be a few uh, variables around that, but uh, it will be predominantly online because like at the moment I work with uh, or mentor somebody in Sunshine Coast, Sydney and Perth. So I already undertake these online mentoring um, uh, sessions, but I am even in Toowoomba as well. So, uh, but I just haven't systemized or created a structure around it. It's just been ad hoc. So I'm just creating a system around it and everyone will have a different kind of place of where they're at. Oh, cool. And so tell me about the, the other the four module part. So you've got the, I think you said sports psych and then the academies. Yeah, the academies. So at, at the moment, uh, so I'm looking to run academies with sports I've worked in the most. Um, so which would be athletics, rugby league, uh, soccer and boxing. And so that'll be, although the online academies uh, also have um the other coaches involved as well. So I currently was talking to those other health professionals in regards to uh, how we can actually work together the best, um, but that'll integrate, say, a session where um, that's with the sports psych and that's as a group. So it's gonna be as a group with the sports psych and obviously then they can contact that person for further sessions. So same as a dietitian, it'll be uh, a group dietetic session and then they can contact the a diet, dietitian for more information, but, um, and then uh, in regards to the coaching, I think coaching is a little bit more nuanced. So in regards to sports coaches, I'll just have the sports coaches come on board and it'll be more like a Q and A type session, which is a little bit different to a workshop. So um, that's kind of how I'm looking to uh, run it. Well, it sounds like there's a lot on the horizon, if not already. <laughs> <laughs> Kurt, I just want to thank you for being a guest on the Mind Your Body Show and acknowledge you for all the work that you do in athletics, rugby, soccer, um, um, and all the other sports that you play. <laughs> what different did I miss? Boxing, um, Boxing. in particular, and th those four sports. And uh, of course, acknowledge you for the research that you're doing, particularly on the menstrual cycle stuff and performance. I find that hugely interesting. And I think it's going to be it's just going to be massive in the next few years, that research. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me, uh, Jacob. And uh, 
Uh, I think the one thing I just want to kind of leave everyone with is that when we look at menstrual cycle research, just be critical of how the study is undertaken rather than just go with the conclusion because that's what we're trying to get is a consistent methodology to get good outcomes. So that's what we're aiming for. Awesome. All right. It's not time to go right now because now it's time for a little bit of fun, which is our 10 and 10. Oh, oh okay. Okay. Yep. Uh, and, nice and of course, if there's anything that comes up that you think of that you um, might have forgotten throughout the episode so far, feel free to jump in and, and say it. But uh, our 10 and 10 is 10 quick questions in 10 seconds. It's supposed to be 10 seconds per question, but we're not too strict on it. Um, <laughs> but the first thing that comes to mind. All right, you ready to go? Yeah. Okay, number one, first thing that comes to mind when you think of drawing. Uh, drawing, I just think of my sketch pads and going through, I used to uh, draw like a bunch of anime characters and stuff like that. So that's kind of how I used to get into drawing. And then I just expanded from there. Um, started with graphite, going into uh, more colorful stuff. And then weirdly enough, uh, I end up, uh, I've actually drawn a couple of different things for different people now. So I've got a few, few uh, friends, family members that actually have my drawings on their wall. So I get into design and art a bit. So that's kind of what comes to mind when I think of drawing. That's cool. So you're interested in architecture. You still kind of get to play around with that a little bit, I suppose. Yeah, a bit, yeah. In, in the fact that you're drawing. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. A bit of design in the background. So I do a little <laughs> bit of uh, graphic design as well. I've done, I've done some uh, corporate logos and marketing material for other companies and that here and there too. So I love a bit of design work. Is there anything that you don't do? <laughs> <laughs> I like to be a jack of all trades. Um, <laughs> but I, I think I come from a background of design, uh, really. So. I think that's why that's kind of a little bit of passion in the background, really. So that's why, like, when I say I design things, design comes in multiple facets, right? So it's it's uh, designing programs, designing like drawings, designing uh, graphic design, that kind of stuff, woodwork, like all these kind of things. Just any kind of design, I like. So yeah. I like to say the sports science is someone who's interested in um, the science of things, but also interested in sports way of being creative, designing programs and yeah, things like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, all right. So actually, did you design your logo on your shirt there? Yes, I did. Cool. All right. Number two, starting out in strength and conditioning. Uh, starting out in strength and conditioning. Um, first thing comes to mind was a man named Martin Unicom. So um, Marty was my boss uh, when I worked at Griffith University, but he was also my head of college. Uh, he, um, I found two, sub or found two subjects in uh, when I was doing PE teaching because I just started work. And so I know this is longer than 10, 10 seconds, but I just started work. And so I just skipped a ton of uh, lectures and now really important lectures. And so I found two subjects because I just neglected it. Um, and he sat me down at the head of college and said, we need to chat about this. I go, oh, look, I've changed exercise science. He's like, oh, really? I, I studied exercise science. Let's have a chat. And so he actually was really good and really instrumental in uh, helping me uh, develop as a coach because he was also, he got me into Queensland University Rugby League, which helped me then tour with the Australian University Rugby League team uh, for the World Cup as well. So he, starting out in uh, strength conditioning, he was not a strength and conditioning coach that mentored me, but he was a, a valuable person to talk to about um, who to contact and where to go because I started with no, knowing nobody. It was great. It's really, it's really interesting because I've done 40 plus episodes of this now. And when I speak to strength and conditioning coaches in particular, then what I just realized, I had a little um, light bulb go off. The thing that I noticed is that usually people get their start in the industry through connecting with someone. It's just that one person that they have this connection with and it all essentially goes from there. Yeah. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's just interesting. Um, all right, number three, keynote speaking. Uh, keynote speaking. So uh, keynote speaking. Uh, sorry, I'm just moving around a little bit at the moment. So um, just because they are a class came in which I didn't expect them to come in. So um, keynote speaking, I think of, uh, Queen Street Mall in Brisbane uh, in 2016. Uh, so uh, I was offered to be the keynote speaker for National Science Week. I think that's what it was, National Science Week. And so I presented uh, in National Science Week uh, in front of tons of different people with Hamish uh, from uh, QAS at the time. And 
Uh, and yeah, that's where I got into ballet from there. So that that was what first came to mind for keynote speaking. The ballet is really awesome. I think that's cool. I think they're some of the best athletes on the planet. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Number four, staying in a club for an extended period of time in order to get a broad spectrum of experience. Well, um, first thing that comes to mind is is uh, is loyalty, but um, in regards to that, I think the biggest thing when you stay at a club in for a long period of time is showing that you actually make change and make connections. So it's great to be able to stay at a club one year, then move to the next club and progress. But uh, I find if you can stay at a club, it shows that you're also making uh, change, you're actually influencing and, and that you actually can create those connections to build success over, over that club. Mm -hmm. Number five, female sport. Oh, um, first thing that comes to mind in female sport, um, is the fact that it's progressed so rapidly. And this is a conversation I like to have with people around injuries, because we look at injuries and the reason why we assume female athletes have more injuries is because female athletes have gone from this level to this level in a matter of five to 10 years, where there's been limited support to maximum support. And so you're chucking athletes into higher levels without having a a five to 10 year grounding of the sport. So that's what comes to mind in female sport is the, uh, the issues around longevity before we get to a higher level performance. Oh, I'd love to know more about that. That could be a whole nother episode. <laughs> we can chat about that another time. Yeah. Number six, the limitations of doing research. Uh, limitations, there are many limitations around research. First thing that comes to mind uh, is, is funding. Um, but, there's a lot of funding in research, but when we look at limitations in research, uh, there's, there's more than just funding. It's about methodology, it's about participation numbers. Uh, it's about not being able to get the cohort you want at the time. And I think that's the biggest limitation. Like I was originally gonna conduct it with all the athletes at um, the football club. And I think there might be five or six going to the W League, which means that cuts a bunch of my co cohort away. So I have to add a, a few more and find out where I'm gonna get them from. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Number seven, conditioning. Uh, conditioning is variability. Um, first word that comes to mind, conditioning is variability and uh, being able to use the term MAS without a meaning MAS. And what I mean by that is I'll run an MAS drill, uh, I'll run a conditioning drill based off MAS results, but I'll mix in sprints, I'll mix in uh, conditioning and lactic efforts, and then, but I'll all prescribe that off an MAS value. Just quickly, in case anyone's not sure, MAS stands for Maximal Aerobic Speed. Yes. Correct. Number eight, RPE, which I should also mention, stands for Rate of Perceived Exertion. So number eight, yeah. RPE. <laughs> uh, effort and intensity. And if you go by uh, the 80-20 method, that's what you'll end up getting with RPE. So it has a, has a limitation in that because what I mean by 80-20 is 80% of people will buy in, 20% of people won't. Um, so uh, you're going to get... 80% people working hard when you have a high RPE and 20% won't. But I mean, that's a limitation in it, but I feel you still get good value. Number nine, revolve athletic. Uh, progression, so, and community. So that's for, for revolve. Um, revolve is about bringing people together and making sure that everyone's connected. And so unfortunately I haven't found a way just yet, but I have Brad Hall um, who's an Olympian and Xbox that I worked with, uh, draw up a, an image, uh, which is an Aboriginal painting. Um, and I wanted to integrate that with Revolve because it's about community and coming together from all different walks of life. But I haven't been able to integrate that yet to the logo. It's taken me a while, but um, yeah, so coming together. Uh, I look forward to seeing what it does look like. Number yeah. 10 is a random question, which I ask everyone. And that is if you could go forward in time or back in time, which would you go to, where and why? Uh, I'd never go back in time because I think we learn so much from our mistakes. Um, I'd only go forward in time uh, and I'd probably just go forward in time to uh, skip the hard work parts and see what else I can do from there. And it doesn't mean getting to the easy parts, but what it means is having already built the systems so then I can actually work on harder parts to see what that's like. Oh, awesome, very good answer. All right, Kurt, thank you so much for joining us on the Mind Your Body Show. No problem. Thanks for having me.